how many people here actually know about InfluxDB as a project? Okay, it's like half maybe. Uh, so, um, InfluxDB is an open source time series database uh, that I started about three and a half years ago. Um, so this talk is about the storage engine that we made, obviously, and um, some of the other things that we used along the way. Uh, and there's also some material at the end about a new piece of the storage engine that we're testing out now that will be, it's in the nightly builds now and it will be dropping as a default feature in the near future. So the storage engine of the database is basically kind of two storage engines in one. The database is like two databases in one. The first is a time series database, which basically just it has, you know, a time series and a collection of values and timestamps in time sorted order, right? And we do compression and stuff like that on, on the time series. And then there's an inverted index. Now, normally when you think about an inverted index, you think about uh, search databases, right? Like they map uh, terms to document IDs and, and you use an inverted index to quickly look up what documents match which search terms. In our case, we're matching uh, time series metadata with the time series that we have. So before I get into the actual storage engine, I need to introduce kind of like how we structure data inside of Influx. Um, so obviously everything is indexed by time uh, and the series that it is. So within the database, we also have this concept of shards which are basically just blocks of time. So in this example, we have one shard for each day. Now all the time series data for a given day will exist in that one shard. Um, so that makes it efficient later on to drop old data if we want to. So this is what InfluxDB's data looks like. So this is uh, our line protocol, which is basically just a text protocol for writing data into the database. So first we have a measurement name, it's a string, then we have tags, which are key value pairs, where the values are strings. And then we have fields, key value pairs, where the values are different value types that we support. And finally, we have a timestamp. Now that looks like a second, level, second precision epic, but we actually uh, store timestamps at the nanosecond scale. Um, and a lot of people have expressed uh, surprise or shock that we support nanosecond scale timestamps because you wouldn't think that you would need that but we actually have a number of users and customers that use nanosecond scale timestamps. So think uh, people in high frequency trading firms or people doing uh, scientific research in like quantum computing environments, those actually require nanosecond precision timestamps to track that data. All right, so looking at an example here, so each series and field map to a unique ID. So basically that's what we think of as a series, right? We have the measurement name, the tag set, and the actual field. So the series is basically just gonna be a time order collection of values. So you can look at it as like a time or a collection of tuples, right? Where you have a timestamp and a value. Uh, so there we have that each one. So, uh, so looking at how to organize time series data in say a key value store, this is like one way you could do it, right? You have the key, which is your ID, and then a timestamp, and then you have a value. So here we have you know, one value in series one and one value in series two. And then if we were to insert a new value into series one, we just put it there in the key space. So the, the important thing is that the key space needs to be ordered. You need to be able to do a range scan over the key space to get your data in you know, time series order. So here's just inserting more. Now, there are a lot of storage engines out there uh, that have this model, right? Uh, LevelDB's got it, LMDB's got it, a bunch of like key value stores that let you do range scans uh, through the key space. So the question is, why in the hell would we want to create our, new st our own storage engine, right? This is a problem that is fiendishly difficult. Um, I've heard people say like, uh, a, store, a new database storage engine takes like 10 years to mature. Like it takes a long time to actually build it so that it's robust and you can rely on it. So why in the hell would we want to do that? Well, first we used LSM trees. So specifically we used LevelDB, which is uh, an embedded database. It's a C++ library that was written at Google. 
um, and it's what's called a log structured merge tree. Now, LSM trees are heavily optimized for write throughput. They're very, very fast with that. They also do compression. Um, and we tried, so we, for the first, I don't know, like year and a half of the project, we used LevelDB as the underlying data store. Uh, and we also tried some of the variants later on. We tried HyperLevelDB, which is a fork of it. We tried RocksDB, which is a fork of LevelDB that's uh, developed at Facebook. Um, when we first started uh, Influx, Rocks actually didn't exist. Uh, so one problem with LSM trees is the del deletes are very, very expensive. So when you do a delete, you actually write a tombstone record uh, to disk, and then later on when you query, uh, you have to resolve the keys in the database with the tombstones to ex that exist to actually return the real result. And then later on, a compaction process will run that will rewrite your uh, SS tables to remove that record, right? So basically, to remove a single record, you end up rewriting a bunch of other records, uh, which can get expensive. And one pro another problem we had was, as I mentioned, we, we organize our data into shards of time, and what, how we did that was we created a new level DB database for each block of time. And this wasn't a problem initially, but for users that had very, very large databases or very large spans of time, they would actually end up blowing out the number of file handles open in the process. So we just run out of file descriptors. So we also tried uh, memory, on, memory mapped copy on write B plus trees, right? So LMDB is this, the first version of MongoDB was this, uh, there is a library in Go called VoltDB, which is the one we used. It was heavily inspired by LMDB. Um, so copy on write B plus trees are pretty cool. They're, they're good. Uh, but the write throughput really sucks on them. They're not optimized for write heavy workloads. What we found is that initially the write throughput would be pretty good. And then as the database grew in size, it would get slower and slower. And even worse, it would crush IOPS on our disks. Like you'd see I'd like IOPS spikes to like 20,000 and all sorts of crazy stuff. And the one, another thing that was kind of a complete deal breaker for us was with Bolt, it would size the memory mapped file. It would have a size and every time it started to overgrow that, it would overgrow that size, it would double the size of the file, right? So it's not that big of a deal when you're, grow when you're growing from 256 megabytes to 512 megabytes, but when we're in the gigabyte scales and, and hundreds of gigabytes, uh, it would just freeze the entire database while it resized that file, uh, which sucked. And then the other thing that was also a deal breaker for us is there's no compression in it. There's no compression built into that storage engine, so you would have to layer it on top. Uh, and for the time series use case, compression is actually very, very important. So none of the solutions that we saw out there actually met our requirements, right? We needed something that supported high write throughput. We needed something that had really good read performance, um, which is the weird thing about time series. It's like the worst possible use case for databases because not only do you have high write throughput, you also have high read throughput from all the dashboarding systems and monitoring systems and stuff. They're just pummeling the database with range requests all the time. Uh, and we needed something with better compression. So we looked at different techniques for compressing time series data, and what we found was that we could achieve better compression than a generalized algorithm like Snappy. So we wanted to optimize that. We needed something where writes wouldn't block reads, and reads can't block writes. We would rather read stale data than to have a read block the block uh, writes coming into the system. Um, and the other thing about time series data is that it's largely an append-only workload. You're not updating records, right? You're just appending new data, or you're doing backfill of historical data. So, and it's always moving. So if you do a read and it's a little bit stale, you're talking about microseconds or milliseconds or maybe seconds uh, that weren't included in the request. So we also need to be able to write multiple ranges simultaneously. Um, so one of the use cases uh, that we have come up a lot is sensor data. And in many sensor data scenarios, you have lagged data collection, right? So they'll collect locally and they'll transmit the data like once an hour, once every four hours, or once a day. So we know that at any given time, there could be writes happening in different time ranges in the database 
that are all somewhat close to now, but could be off. And something that could support hot backups. At the time, level DB, well, level, I don't think level DB at this point supports backups, hot backups either, but Rox does. So, but at the time we didn't have an option for it. Uh, and we need to have many databases open in a single process without it crashing things. So, uh, about a year and a half ago, we set about to create our own storage engine, which we call the Time Structure Merge Tree, or TSM Tree. Uh, it's heavily inspired by LSM trees, but it's a little bit different. So here are the different components of the storage engine. We have a write-ahead log, we have an in-memory cache, and we have index files that are read-only. This is very, very similar to how LSM trees are structured, right? Write-ahead log, same, same concept. In LSM tree, in level DB it's called mem tables. Uh, in level DB it's called SS tables, right? Uh, but they're basically the same things, right? So going through what it looks like when we write data to the storage engine, we have awesome time series data coming in. We write it to the wall. We write it to in memory, the in memory data structure that can be queried. And then we send a response back to the client at this point because we know the write is durable and it's immediately available for reads. And then periodically we'll do flushes of this in-memory index to what we call uh, TSM files, which are basically those SS table. They're files that are indexed, that have a specific structure, that are read-only files. And we also memory map those files so we can access them like they're an array. Um, but more importantly, we let the operating system handle caching for us, right? We let it page stuff in and out of memory so that we don't have to write all that logic ourselves. So we get a bunch of stuff for free by memory mapping the files. So here's what a TSM file looks like. We have a header, we have blocks of data, we have an index, and then we have a footer. So the header looks like this. You have the magic, the magic four bytes that tell you what kind of file it is, and then we have a version. The blocks look like this, right? So we have a collection of blocks, we have a CRC, and then we have the actual data, uh, where the data is compressed time series data for a given series, right? Uh, and, and then if we have a new series, we'll have a new block. And actually, even for a given series, we don't compress all of its data in one run, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, then we have an index, so we can see the key length, the key itself, which is a string key, right? The measurement name, the tag set, the field. Uh, we have the number of values that are in the file, uh, the min time and the max time. And we use that basically so that when a query comes in looking for a specific time range, we can find which file it's in and where in the file it is uh, quickly. And then finally we have a footer that just tells us where the start of the index is. So basically when we have that memory map file, we know we look at the last uh, four bytes of, of the array, we can jump to that spot where the index is and we're able to do things on the index uh, as if it's like an in-memory structure, right? So we can do searches and stuff. So here's what the compressed blocks look like. You have a type, which is uh, the type of the, of the field. We support int64, float64, booleans, and strings which is actually a, quite a bit different from other time series databases. Many other time series databases only let you store numbers. And usually it's a specific kind of number, either a float 64 or an int 64. Uh, and then we have timestamps and values. So this is the part where I say we, we, we break series data into blocks of things because we, we separate the timestamps and values because we can achieve better compression so by default, we will encode up to a thousand value timestamp pairs into a single one of these blocks. So if a request comes in for a single value, we actually end up decoding a thousand worth, right? So looking at the compression, the timestamps we encode based on the precision and the deltas between them, right? So we support nanosecond level precision, but just because we support that doesn't mean we need to represent all the lower order bits if they're all zeroed out, right? So in the best case scenario, we can use run length encoding for our timestamps. So if you have a regular time series where you're taking samples once every 10 seconds, 
right? You only need second level precision. So all you need to do is store the initial starting timestamp and the delta between them. And you know like, okay, so we, have, we can just construct any timestamp in the run from that information. So the OK case, we use a compression technique called Simple 8B. It's pulled from this paper, Anna Moffitt and Index Compression Using 64-Bit Words. Um, so that's cases where it looks kind of like a double delta encoding, right? So timestamps aren't fixed. They, they aren't fixed collection intervals at bucketed times. They could be variable, right? They could have some jitter by a second or two or microseconds or milliseconds. So in the worst case is we actually have to store the raw value. We have to store the full int64 timestamp. So that's, that comes up in situations where people are like using nanosecond scale timestamps, but the distance between each timestamp is too great to represent as like a delta, or like the, the cost of representing it would be more than just storing the raw timestamp itself. So for float64 compression, we use a double delta technique. Uh, it's very similar to uh, the Facebook gorilla paper. So in, two th in the summer of 2015, Facebook published a paper about uh, Gorilla, which is their metric system that they have in-house. Uh, and it used this, um, this compression technique for their float values. And they said that they could compress data down to, depending on the shape of the data, down to about 1.1 bytes per. They're using 32-bit uh, uh, timestamps, which is different than us. Um, they're also interleaving timestamps and values, which we don't do, so we kind of changed it up a bit. Um, so this guy, Damian Grisky, who's a pretty well-known Go developer, wrote an implementation of this uh, after the paper came out, and we just kind of took that, forked it, and actually made the modifications that we needed uh, for our use case. Booleans are bits, those are easy, right? Uh, in 64, we use Double delta or zigzag encoding, zigzag's the same as protobufs. Uh, strings, we just use snappy. Uh, we're thinking about adding dictionary compression later, but snappy's good enough for now. So, updates. We can actually update values. It's not something we're optimized for, uh, but basically if uh, any value in the database is keyed off of the measurement name, tag set, field, and nanosecond scale timestamp. Right, so you can only have one value at any given series key and nanosecond scale timestamp. So if you write in another value with that exact same information, it will take the place of the one that exists. So essentially, we resolve that at query time by eliminating the older dupes, and then later on, when the compaction process runs, it throws out the old value and keeps the new value. Deletes, this is very similar to an LSM tree. We write a tombstone. The the at query time, we resolve the tombstones with the data that we read from the index and the in-memory index, uh, and then compactions later will rewrite the TSM files and remove the deleted data. So, compactions. Basically what they do is they just combine multiple TSM files into one larger TSM file. Um, our goal with the compactions is to put as many points from the same series into a single file, right? So that they have a run, a contiguous run. That way we can do quick range scans on the data and do computations on it, right? Um, I mentioned points in 1K blocks, and we have multiple levels of compaction, right? Where we favor the lower levels first and then the larger levels later. Uh, and the other thing is, as we're compacting data, we, the, the TSM files are in time order. They have time ranges in them. So if you're just writing now data, right, you're pending new data all the time, those older files will get to a point where they get compacted and then they won't get touched, right? We'll only be touching the young generation of TSM files. But because we have this idea of shards, shards generally will go cold for writes after some time. So after a while, we will actually try to do a full compaction on that shard, which will look at all the TSM files and try to optimize for the best possible like, combination. All right. So now I'll talk a little bit about the indexing scheme that we have. 
So this is, to go through this, we'll have to look at this sample query uh, just so we understand like the, the kind of scope of the problem, right? So in this query, we're grabbing the 90th percentile of value from the CPU measurement uh, for the last 12 hours only from hosts in the Western region and we want 10 minute buckets and we want a series for every single host, right? Uh, now the question becomes, how do we map this metadata, the measurement name CPU, host, the region, to the underlying series so that we can perform this computation and return a bunch of individual time series back? So we use an inverted index, right? So one would, so the way to look at it, like what we do right now for the in-memory index is we have, you know, those series keys, which is that string, which maps to a unique ID. And we need to see what measurements have what fields so we can map that later. We need to see for what hosts, what values we have, right, the tag key host and what in unique values. For the region, what regions we have. And then we need to keep our posting lists, right? What IDs appear under the CPU measurement, what IDs appear under each tag key value pair. And then later, after, when you're querying the data, you can do things like unions and intersects uh, to, to find out what are the list of series IDs that you need to work with. So index V1, which is what's in the current release right now, which is 1.2, uh, is in memory. Uh, and we load it on boot, right? So we have all the underlying TSM files. When the database starts up, it looks at those files, looks at the series keys in each of those files, and builds this in-memory index. And what that means is, one, you're obviously memory constrained, right? You can only have as many unique series in your database as you can actually keep in the in-memory index. But you can also get to a stage where you have slower boot times if you have really high cardinality. So you could have a ton of memory, but you know, on a system where you have you know, a few hundred gigabytes of memory, it takes a long time to boot that up and read that much data into memory, right? So our goal with index v2 was we wanted something that is on disk and in memory, like a combination. And really like the key problem we were trying to solve here is that we have a lot of use cases where time series are ephemeral, right? So if you're thinking about tracking uh, container metrics or individual process metrics, and you want the container ID or the process ID to be in a tag, like those are ephemeral, right? You could have the process running for a few hours, a few days, uh, and then it's gonna go away, and you may query it later, but most likely, it's not in your working set. It's not hot for queries or for writes after it goes away. So we wanted something that would work for those kinds of ephemeral series. So, we, uh, let's see, like last September we started creating something we called, we just called it TSI for time series index because we are tired of trying to be creative with naming. Um, so uh, here's kind of what it looks like, right? So new data comes in and we have the index and we say, okay, here's the time series metadata, which is really just that key itself, right? We check the in-memory index, we, then we check the on-disk index, do we already have it? If we do, we don't need to do anything. We don't need to write it to disk, we just continue, continue with, on about our business. But if we don't have it, then we need to write it to a write-ahead log, right, an append-only file, uh, and then periodically that wall, and write it to an in-memory index, and then periodically that wall will get flushed out to disk. So this is very, very similar to, um, to TSM, to our, to our other engine. And then there are compactions that run in the background to combine these index files into larger and larger index files, right? Again, just like TSM. So here's what uh, a log entry looks like in our write ahead log. We have a flag. The reason there's a flag is because you can do a deletion or an insertion of new series metadata. You have a measurement name, you have tag key value pairs, and a checksum. So the index file looks like this. We have a number of different blocks. We have block for what series exist in the index, uh, what tags exist, uh, a tag key value pairs, and then uh, what measurements exist. And then offsets for the different locations of the blocks. 
So let's look a little bit at what the series block looks like. Um, so we have these different like components in it, right? We have different series keys, and then we have an index, and then we have a bunch more series keys, and then another index, uh, and then some other stuff. Now the reason we have series keys and then an index and then more series keys and then an index is because we, we don't, we don't want to have to read all the series keys into memory at one time. So by default, we, we write out 65,000 series keys at a time. Uh, and these are always written in sorted order. So what that means is, as we're going through and compacting index files, we can actually do it in, as a streaming job, right? We can read multiple index files, merge them together, and write out the 65K series, and more, and more, and more, and more, right? So we never have to have more than 65,000 series keys in memory to actually get it out to disk. All right, so let's look at this hash index thing. So the point of the hash index is if we have a series key, right, and we hash it to uh, a bucket, right? So here, say this is our hash table, and we have positions 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, and what is at those positions are locations in the file, uh, byte offsets, right? So say we have this series key right here, and we hash it using whatever hashing algorithm you like, uh, and we say, oh, that, that maps to uh, bucket one. So we see that's at 234, so we jump to that spot in the file, and then we say, okay, there's the length of the series key, and then we can look and see if the key is actually the same. So that would be a lookup to see, like, do we have this in this file, right? Uh, so, the technique that we used, uh, and this one, this one is really interesting. I had never heard about this technique uh, up until, like, last fall or summer. Uh, it's called Robin Hood hashing, so it's been around for a while. Um, but it has some advantages to it that actually fit our use case really, really well. Uh, you can fully load a table. You don't have to, so normally with a hash table, right, like you, you, don't, you wanna have extra space so you don't have a bunch of collisions because if you have hash collisions, then it gets more expensive to do lookups, right? So we don't have to keep linked lists for lookups. And with Robinhood hashing, it's actually really good if you're doing uh, read-only hashes. Like I said, our TSI files are immutable. We write them once and then they get read a bunch of times. So once we compute this hash index, we never have to write it again. So we don't have to worry about updates or inserts. We don't have to worry about deletes, uh, which means the cost of computing it is amortized over time. So I'm gonna jump through and look like look at Robinhood hashing, kind of try to explain it, so hopefully it's understandable. So at the top we have you know, the positions in the hash table. Uh, the middle section will be the keys, the, the keys that we're looking up. And the last one is what we call probes, which I'll, I'll explain. Now, for this example, I'm just gonna use single character keys so that it fits nicely on the slide and everything looks good. So, First, we're, we're gonna insert A into the hash table. We do the hash, and A comes up with position zero. We look, nothing's there, so we'll put A there. Okay, now we're gonna do B. B hashes to position one. Luckily enough, there's nothing there, so we put B there. Uh, now, we're gonna insert C. C hashes to position one, and we look, and B's already there. So the next thing we do, since we, since we can't put it there, is we actually look at the probe length of B, which we see is zero. But at this point, C's probe length is zero. So what the probe length is, is the number of hops you would need to make forward in the hash table to find that element, to find that key. So because they're both the same, we say we're gonna skip to the next location, look it up, and since there's nothing there, we put C there and we mark it down as a probe length of one. So we have that for bookkeeping later. Now, we'll throw away the probe lengths array after we've computed the thing and written it out to disk, but we need it while we're constructing the hash table. Okay, so the next one is we're gonna try to insert D. It hashes to position one. We say, oh no, we can't do it because A is already there. 
So we move over to the next position. B is already there, but at this point, we've tracked that D has a probe length of one, and B has a probe length of zero. So we kick B out of position, and we put D there, and we mark its probe length as one, and then we look to see if we can insert B in the next position over. Nope, it's full, C's there, but C has a probe length of one also, so we just have to go to the next spot over to look for D's spot. It's available, we see it's there, so we put B there and we mark the probe length of two. So this kind of moving things around, this gets to why it's named Robin Hood hashing. You rob from the probe rich and you give to the probe poor, right? Uh, where probe rich is as close to zero as possible, <laughs> which is counterintuitive. Um, so another, so basically, what, and what you can see here is like when you do lookups on it, you jump to the next positions. So there's a refinement that you can make uh, for the lookups. So when you write this hash table, one, you need to write, you know, the, the, the table itself, which is that keys table. In our case, we store um, byte positions in the file of where to look up the key. Um, uh, but you need to store that, and then you need to store the max probe length. Everything else can get thrown away. But one other thing you can do is you can actually look at the average probe length and store that too. So in our case, we're just gonna say, ignore position four, say that isn't there, and we're just gonna say the average probe length is one. So what that means is when we have a lookup later on, we do the hash to find its position, and then we add the average to it. So in this case, D hashes to zero, we add one to it, and we end up finding the exact thing on the first hit without having to move the probe at all. And essentially what you end up doing is if you look it up and you add, add it and you have a miss, you move the probe back and forth between the right and left side until you get to a position where you either have a miss or you've found the element. So here's what a cache miss looks like. So say we're trying to look up Z to see if it exists in the file. Z hashes to zero and we see, okay, well, A is not Z, so that's not it. So we move the probe and we say, well, D is not Z, so that's not it. And notice we're tracking where we are in the probe length for, for Z. So we move the probe again uh, and C is not Z, and we're at probe length two now. And at this point, we know we can exit because we've stored the max probe length. We know nothing in the table has a probe length more than two, so we know it's a cache miss. Uh, okay, so the last section I just want to talk about a little bit uh, is um, a cardinality estimation. So we estimate, estimate the cardinality of how many unique series there are in a file in the index, uh, how many measurements there are, and how many values there are for a given uh, tag key, which is us useful data for our internal telemetry, and we'll be adding stuff to the query language later to actually expose this information uh, to, do th to do like all sorts of different stuff. So we uh, keep sketches, basically. We use hyperlog log plus plus, which is basically uh, some improvements on the old HLL algorithm, uh, but not gonna cover those in this talk, so. But we'll have more details and a more detailed write-up about this coming soon. Uh, it's in the nightly build for 1.3 right now. It's a feature that you can turn, or the, the in, indexing stuff. So it's a feature that you can turn on with a flag in the config. I actually wrote a blog post about it a couple of weeks ago, so it's listed in there, it tells you how to do it. So that is my talk, thank you. Thank you, Paul. So now we're going to have questions. Thank you very much. Paul, thanks for the great talk. I had a question. So um, almost a decade ago, I had used a tool called RRD. So is, does InfluxDB have capabilities to, roll up, to do roll-ups, essentially? 
you know, like RRD tool does, you know, like aggregate time yeah. series by hours or minutes and days? Yeah, so we have a feature called continuous queries, which will let you, basically you can have different retention policies in the database. Retention policy sets how long you want to keep the data around. You can keep it around forever, or you can say, I have, you know, I want to keep this high precision data around for seven days and this medium precision data around for three months. And the database will automatically handle evicting it for you. And like I said, because of the way we organize the data on disk, it's really just dropping files. So it's not like we're rewriting indexes and all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, so continuous queries is one way to get that. We have another project called Capacitor, which is basically a processing engine for influx uh, flavored time series data. Uh, and you can do aggregations and downsampling and that kind of stuff using Capacitor. It's a bit more powerful than our continuous query language. Um, so yeah, you can do that. The thing about RRD that makes it a bit different is RRD is a round robin database, so it actually only works for samples at fixed intervals of time. Uh, it also doesn't give you compression, right? Because round robin databases are just like, we, have, we know we, want, we have samples that we're taking once every minute, and we want to keep two days worth of samples, so it just allocates a file of that size and sh sh sh, like, you know, rotating buffer. So, got it. Thanks. Yep. Hi. Uh, two questions. Uh, is it written in Go? The yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The database is written in Go. Okay. Okay. Um, and the secondary question is, I tried to use the the Scala client, uh, maybe about two or three months ago, and it didn't work. Yeah. That's because we actually. We actually haven't written any of the clients. We actually just kind of kicked it over to the community. So, okay, so uh, I should probably get in that and fix it up for them. Yeah, yeah. They, they, at this point, at this stage, all of the client libraries are community contributed. We will take over ownership at some point, but it just hasn't been a priority. What with everything else, basically. So, if you have VC money and you want to give it to us, we'll hire a client. Well, I, have, I have. I have. I <laughs> have. I have my own money I want to use your DB for. <laughs> so maybe that's a different conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, just uh, I, I think I know where there's a client to kind of work with the Influx DB. I, I run it of Scala. So uh, I can tell you later. Yeah, I, I, I definitely know we have Scala users. I'm just not sure. I, I'm sure if you do a search, there are probably yeah, just, multiple uh, libraries. It's coming that. from the Flink example. I, my question is uh, so the. Uh, InfluxDB is a real-time uh, database. What kind of a data do you usually store? I mean, you're monitoring that data, you know, sensor data, that's fine. Do you, how that compare to other real-time databases? For example, Druid type of, is a real-time OLAP databases. So is there, compared to two type of databases, in, in the, there's a, do you, what's the best practice? What kind of a data you store there? Do you favor OLAP data or any data? Or, you know, just try to get a sense of which one should you use for what? Uh, I mean, so our two primary use cases are um, monitoring data, so you're talking about server metrics, application performance monitoring data, and sensor data. So those are, you know, generally you're doing computations on them, like histograms, percentiles, min, max, mean, all that kind of stuff, standard deviation. Um, so we're optimized for that. You can store like real time, uh, real like user analytics data in our database as well. But Druid, for example, was built originally at MetaMarkets, which does uh, like behavioral analytics for ad tech companies. So it's a very it its foundation is very very different. Like it's more like counting events and slicing and dicing on whatever dimensions you want to slice and dice those on. So. Druid will absolutely beat Influx in any sort of bake-off if that's what you're doing, because that's what it was designed for originally. Um, so I haven't, it's been a while since I looked at the project. It was certainly like before the company that got started around Druid was founded, so I'm sure they've actually done a lot more since that time. Um, but the other ones we get compared to are Graphite, uh, which is around Robin database, so it doesn't work for event driven data, whereas our goal was we wanted it, we wanted Influx to work for regular and irregular time series. So a regular series is samples at fixed intervals, but an irregular one is largely event driven. So events could be requests to an API, they could be page views, they could be trades in a stock market or quotes. Um, so 
generally our use cases are, our biggest one is monitoring followed by kind of real-time analytics or sensor data, and then there's a small group of people using it for financial market data. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, at one point, I think you showed your like series range uh, blocks, mm -hmm. and um, you mentioned compression techniques like deltas, but it, you just mentioned also like it's, you can have a regular. So, you, you basically uh, can get events out of time, out of order, because um, mm -hmm. that time is not, you, you don't write clients, so it's not determined by you. What, what you could get stuff like way out of order, like way delayed as well, right? Like yes. a time, could, let's say it's, you got some data reported to you an hour late. Um, what yep. do you do with that? Because you've already flushed a disk, you've already, uh, is it when you compact things that you'll find stuff out of order and read? Yeah, well, like so, the, yeah, so if we get, it depends on what the out of order data looks like, right? So. There are use cases, what we see in sensor data, most of the time when we get delayed uh, data collection, we see it in sensor data use cases. Like we have one customer who has, they're instrumenting um, solar panels in Africa and they can only communicate via just GSM network. So they only uh, connect to transmit data once every four hours. And they just like get a package of it and send it up. But even then, like they have different collection intervals for all these, but these are individual time series that are delayed. So the data for a specific series is still generally written in order. It's just that for the different time series, it could be out of order. Um, so although we have queries where you can merge all that data together, so basically if out of order data comes in, we write it to the in-memory index in the wall, later that'll get flushed to a TSM file, right? And at query time, we will sort that dynamically, right? So what that means is you take a hit on performance at query time if we end up having to do that. Uh, but if we don't, then you're good. And then later, when the compaction runs, it will, it will compact that older file into the other files, into new files with the older files, right? So that it makes sure that it's all in order. Right, okay, so that was the point. You, you do have to inspect at least every file, maybe not read the whole file, but just inspect the files so the files are sorted, and then you could see if certain series are showing up for that yeah. same row key, for the same key, essentially. Yeah, so in the- He's in present, you have to- In the index in the file, we have the min time and the max time in the file, and we have the min time and the max time for each series. So when the compaction is running, the series keys in the index are all in sorted order. Mm -hmm. So we look at them and we can merge them at that time, and then, yeah, we know the min and max time, so we uh, know which ones to decode. And, and stuff. one last question for you: Do you canonicalize the keys yourself? Because uh, let's say yes. you got CPU host. Yeah, we, we do that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we, the way we do it is we keep the tags in uh, sorted order, right, by, by key and then value. So um, the, the optimum way to write data in is to write it already sorted, because if you don't, we end up sorting it before we write it actually to the, to the wall. 